and staff. What a beautiful day. Hope you're all social distancing and staying safe. Welcome to our third Voices of Today Fireside, Cheer Set Fireside Chat Series with our dear friend and CCC champion CEO and president of Ravinia Festival, Mr. Wells Kaufman. Hi, Wells. Hey, Joe. How you doing today? Uh, you know, it's a beautiful day. It's a bizarre time, you know? Bizarre time. It's our uh, time. But you know, it's Easter week. It's Passover week. I think we all have a lot to be grateful for because we're well and we're staying safe and we hope everybody else is as well. Yeah, it's a fascinating time. Um, it, it certainly is. Um, we would normally be rehearsing uh, right now, but so we wanted to offer our singers an opportunity to meet and interact with incredible leaders such as yourself. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. It's a real honor. Thank you. Uh, singers, please meet my co-host and Singers Council member, Nikita Sakar. Hey, Nikita. Hi, it's great to be here. A few housekeeping items. We welcome any and all questions throughout our 30 minutes together, so please take this opportunity to engage with our special guest today. You can type your question directly into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and Ms. Lee or I will ask them to Mr. Kaufman during the fireside chat. Special shout out and thanks to Miss Pam for running tech behind the scenes. And without further ado, Nikita, take it away. Hi. Um, so you all should have had a longer bio about Mr. Kaufman pop up in your chat feature, but I just want to highlight some quick facts. He's been the CEO of Ravinia for the past 20 years. And in that time, he's invested more than $65 million into Ravinia's infrastructure and has quadrupled the amount of donors to the not-for-profit while managing to keep ticket prices low for children and college students to ensure that both classical and non-classical music is accessible for everyone. So, Wells, my first yeah. question. How are sure. you holding up during this time? Boy, we're hanging on. You know, it's uh, like, like everybody else trying to navigate through something that no one has ever lived through before. Um, in America, not for a hundred years. I think actually there was a gentleman who actually survived the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918 um, and World War I and World War II, and he's still around. That's kind of a miracle. Um, trying to keep my staff feeling buoyant and connected and my board of directors, the whole Ravinia family, who as you very well know, are an extraordinary um, collection of music lovers and education lovers and uh, folks that really care a great deal about the arts. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Mr. Kaufman, so many of our singers, including myself, had the opportunity to be a part of the video recording of Leonard Bernstein somewhere as part of the Ravinia Music Box experience. Um, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what was your vision for that experience and how did you go about turning that vision into a tangible reality? Uh, it's a great question. So we're talking about a 15 year journey with my Ravinia family. When we started talking about that age old problem that makes classical music lovers worldwide wring their hands, which is where's the new audience gonna come from? Where are the audiences going? What's happened? Um, that's been going on, those kinds of comments, actually since the 19th century, Theodore Thomas early music director of the Chicago Symphony, talked about that in the 1880s, as did John Philip Sousa, who was music director of the Great Lakes Naval Station just north of us um, up in North Chicago. But today, we wanted to figure out not only what the root of the issue was, what kind of issue it was, and how specifically Ravinia could be a part of the solution. So out of that was born the Ravinia Music Box Experience. And we found a terrific partner of tremendously gifted um, techies, basically, who had created the astonishingly great Abraham Lincoln Museum and Library in Springfield that many people may, uh, who are on, on the chat today may have witnessed themselves. Um, I realized after witnessing that experience myself, this Abraham Lincoln experience, that if they could do what they did with Abraham Lincoln, perhaps they could apply similar um, efforts to 
um, my love and our folks' love of Bach and Beethoven and Brahms. Why that connection? Well, I think everybody thinks they know everything about Abraham Lincoln, right? He's on the penny, there's the Lincoln Log, we're in Illinois, he's Father Abraham, he wrote all these great speeches and gave them, Civil War, freed the slaves, all of that. Um, but what happens when you go to Springfield is you realize there's so much more depth, so much more to know, um, so much more horror around what had happened um, during the Civil War and leading up to it. So we partnered with them. We started meeting on a regular basis with the Ravinia family to really try to dig down and understand, again, not only what the issue was, but how Ravinia specifically um, could address it. And one of the things that I said early on to my 400 members of the Ravinia family, our board of trustees and our women's board, associates board and staff was, you know, when we do a big non-classical show, John Legend, Lady Gaga, Maroon 5, James Taylor, <clears throat> we have people who are lining up at 11 in the morning or even earlier to get their place on the lawn. They're then on the lawn uh, for several hours before the show actually begins. So what do they do? They picnic, they see their friends, they go to the restroom, they go to the gift shop, they look at the sculpture, and they still have about three hours left. So in, in fact, what we have is a sort of gently captive audience for a couple of hours. Could we create an experience for those folks to get a little bit of a taste of what the classical music experience is about, um, gently seduce them into perhaps availing themselves of the great Chicago Symphony Orchestra, greatest orchestra in the world, in residence at Ravinia since 1905, um, and all the other classical music offerings that we provide on a very, very reasonable price, right? So everything that we do that's classical, it's free on the lawn for anyone that's a student, it's $10 for their parents, um, and the ticket prices in the pavilion itself, the reserve seats are very low. So what the building is about is to, um, in a very brief way, you can do it in 20 minutes if you want to. Um, it's split up into a kind of teched out show. That's where the children's choir piece comes in. There are a couple of pre ante rooms that people go through and get a taste of what they're going to experience in the theater, and then after that, they exit into a gallery space, which feels more like a traditional museum space. And all of this <clears throat> is linked to our celebration of the late, great Leonard Bernstein, maybe the most extraordinary American musician, any, any country actually. Uh, not only a great composer and conductor and pianist, um, but also someone who was a tremendously gifted social activist connected to his time in very many ways in the, the origins of the Chicago Children's Choir, right? Growing out of the civil rights movement. So Lenny um, never forgot that he was living in the real world. And of course he was America's music teacher. So many people witnessed and became familiar with classical music through the Young People's Concerts, which were on television. Think about it today, a classical music program on prime time every week. It's kind of hard to even fathom, but he was so gifted at it. His kids, his three children often say that, uh, it was not an accident that their father uh, came of age when television came of age because he was matched to it so beautifully, the medium and the person. So one will have a Leonard Bernstein experience as you go through their music box. And I don't really want to say anything more about it because if I could really tell you what it was, we wouldn't have needed to build it. And the children's choir participation in it um, is also something I don't want to go into in too much detail. I wanted somewhere um, from West Side Story of Bernstein to close it. And that's what the big singing moment is that finishes off the sort of teched out, tricked out show, which is only a 60 seat theater. It's a very intimate experience um, and maybe a 10 minute experience for that before one goes into the gallery. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't overtax people, but really gave them that taste, excited them about what this world of, of classical music would really be about. And you know, Bernstein himself didn't like the term classical music. He didn't like the term serious music. He felt that there was good music and then there was music that was not so good. And uh, um, without him, we wouldn't have Mahler the way we have. We wouldn't have so many great American composers, the, the greatest of which probably Copeland, along with Bernstein and Sam Barber and Bill Schumann and Walter Piston. Um, he, uh, again, was the music director of the New York Philharmonic, recorded like crazy with Berlin, Vienna, and New York, toured all over the place, 
um, wrote a lot of Broadway shows, lived in several different worlds in the same way that Ravinia Festival does, right? So we've always had a chunk of us that's been about the popular music of the day, along with the greatest classical music one could provide. And we've really been able to uh, up our game in the last couple of years on how that all works. Well, you've done extraordinary things there, Wells. And I, I'm just so grateful uh, for our friendship um, and for you championing, championing the choir. Could you share with our singers when you first discovered the singers? Sure, happy to. One of my favorite stories. So I come to uh, Ravinia in October of 2000. And one of the first things I wanted to do in addition to meeting all the stakeholders that had a piece of Ravinia, the donors, the trustees, the women's board members, the artists, um, I wanted to meet the movers and shakers in Chicago who um, were bringing great things artistic to uh, uh, this wonderful part of the world that we live in. So that included the Chicago Symphony Orchestra folks, the Grand Park Symphony folks, um, the people that ran the various choirs, the music schools that were so terrific. And I had an opportunity to go to the, the beautiful Chicago Cultural Center to hear you and your children's choir. And I don't think you had started much before that. I think you were still pretty new to the choir. And the idea of choral singing and children's choir in particular, boys choir in particular, has always been a part of my life and my career. So I was looking forward to hearing this. Um, and I was just blown away absolutely blown away by the variety of what you performed, um, by the way the kids looked and moved, um, and their professionalism and their exquisite musicianship. Um, and I've been fortunate to work with the Atlanta Boy Choir with Robert Shaw, the uh, Los Angeles and California Boy Choirs with Carla Maria Giolini. Um, I was a member of the San Francisco Boy Choir, San Francisco Symphony um, Children's Choir. And then in New York, not only the American Boy Choir, but we also, because my music director there was Kurt Mazur and he was from Leipzig, we brought the St. Thomas Kierke Choir, Bach's own choir um, from Leipzig to come and sing uh, the Bach Passions, the B minor Mass. Um, I'll never forget those kids because it was all boys, right? And they were pretty young and they would sing and they sang all the Bach from memory, all of it. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And then they would go out on 65th Street and Broadway and smoke. And I, I just thought, this is the wildest thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. Kids, don't smoke. No smoking. Um, but it was something that I thought, these are real kids, you know? They're, they're real kids. And they're not this kind of kids in a boy choir or a children's choir. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that tradition and style. But certainly the Chicago Children's Choir was definitely not this. And for those of you that don't know what this means, I'll do a whole other Zoom tutorial on what that actually means. It's <laughs> and you and I hit it off, and I thought, we have to work together. We have to do some stuff together. And it started, right? It started real fast. Well, I remember you called me, and you're like, hey, would you like to perform with Ladysmith Black Mambazo? I said, oh, yeah. And then every year, you know, Wyclef Jean, yeah. Chris, uh, Christoph Eschenbach. Oh, great. Oh, great symphony and you know you all you, I have to just say like Wells you were the one that invited us to perform the major works before other institutions and I just really appreciate um, that recognition um, well it was my pleasure and all the conductors loved you guys loved not only the singing of course that has to be top flight right Chicago Symphony Orchestra Christoph Eschenbach James Conlon Bobby McFerrin but it also has to be a sense of joy because if there isn't joy on stage then the audience isn't going to feel it at all they may hear it yeah. but they also have to see it um and i think that's one of the things we're going to be grappling with as we go through this virus situation i mean social distancing at six feet is the antithesis of how an orchestra sets up or a chorus yeah. they're six inches from each other you know that yes with and and you know choirs are one thing but musicians and orchestras there's sweat and there's saliva and there's spit valves and there's all sorts of stuff i was talking to esapeka salin and the great conductor and, and i've known him since he was 25 years old and i was working at the la phil and he said yeah we're kind of a an orchestra is kind of a petri dish for what the virus is all about you know how are we going to figure out how to do this and of course how we're going to figure this out um, as uh, the doctors and the scientists are telling us, is therapeutic remedies and a vaccine. 
And that's going to happen faster than we think. Not tomorrow. They're talking about a year, a year and a half. In the world of music, that's tomorrow. We can last that long. We can survive that long. We can stick together and understand the importance of what it is. And can you imagine what it's going to feel like when the doors actually open up and we're able to make something happen? It's going to be very exciting. And I've lived through 9-11. Um, it was the end of my, my first season at Ravinia was the next day was September 11. Um, and we all have done that, right? I lived through the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. And we did a lot of concerts and performances around that particularly awful time, which then dominoed throughout the country. I found myself in Atlanta right, at, right after the Rodney King riots and those riots were going on. These um, tumultuous moments in American history are key and the financial meltdowns and things like that. Um, I was at the New York Philharmonic, my first week of work, we played the uh, 50th anniversary concert for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations um, in Avery Fisher Hall. Of course, it was Beethoven 9. And my job was to make sure that Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump, and Yasser Arafat didn't fight. Because for some reason, I don't know who thought this was a good idea, all of them were in the same box. Oh, you so I actually had to move them around and literally play peacemaker. And I thought, boy, I really wanted to work in New York and I really wanted to work at the New York Phil, but this was not something I experienced or, or I had any um, uh, uh, experience with at all. We'll get through this. We're gonna make this, we're gonna make this work. Um, we're gonna learn new things about each other. We're gonna learn new things about the depth that, that music gives us and that we feel and that we understand the gift even greater in a greater way than we ever thought before. I know that's going to happen. I know it. Well, you're a great negotiator. Let's. Uh... Go back uh -oh. and uh, uh, <laughs> Farron, him to write the uh, train. He ran to the yes, train. Yes, yes. Work and how you, you know, negotiated Kathleen Battle and Denise Craig. Yeah. Um, so Bobby, of course, is a big part of the Rivinia Music Box. He's our, he's our, here's our Bodhisattva, right? He's the guy that takes people through the experience. He's key with all of you. But the reason why that works so well was, in fact, the beginning, which was that particular performance, which is a Ravinia Women's Board Gala. Our gala uh, raises money for our Reach, Teach, and Play education programs, a key part of uh, what Ravinia Festival does. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come and work Ravinia, I didn't think there would be a summer festival that had an education program. It's kind of a nonsensical thing because you're not working during the school year. But they had a very fine education program and we've grown at leaps and bounds and we're very excited about that happening. So there we are, you and I with Bobby, and with two of the great divas of all time, uh, two African-American singers, Kathleen Battle, the great Kathleen Battle, who Bobby had worked with a great deal, and Denise Graves, who Bobby had known, I think, from church, actually. I think that's how they had met. Um, and we had, they were each going to do their own set, sing some duets at the end. The children's choir was going to do uh, this train commission. We commissioned some terrific composers um, for our, our 100th anniversary in 2004 to write a piece about our beginnings. And our beginnings was a train company. Um, and that was a rehearsal that I'll never forget. So Kathy's in one room, Denise is in another room, you're in another room, Bobby's in another room, the children's choir on stage with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And it's the closest thing I've ever felt to being Jimmy Carter um, and uh, Egypt and Israel, because it was, and I, I don't mean to be lessening or lightening whatever that was and how huge that was in the world, but uh, the two women were not getting along. How, how do we say that? So first Kathy quit, then Denise thought she would quit. Then Kathy decided if Denise was going to quit, she'd stay on. Then Bobby decided he would quit because he just didn't want to put up with it. And I remember coming to you and saying, I think you're conducting and I think you're singing. And I guess I'm singing as well because we don't have anybody else and the show starts in four hours. Somehow, and this is the miracle of Bobby McFerrin, and everybody needs to know this. Everybody knows him from the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, and this phenomenally gifted and completely unique musician, right? Um, and one of the loveliest, warmest people you could ever meet. <clears throat> and he pulled it all together, didn't he? He pulled it all together, along with you and the two women, and it happened, and the show was incredible. It was one of the great experiences of all time. But man, getting to it, woo, that was I'll, something. I'll never forget it, Wells. That was something. I'm... See, and, and for me to be able to provide that kind of Sturm und Drang to the Chicago Children's Choir, that's a good thing. Uh, everybody grew up a lot that day. Yeah, <laughs> genius, genius. Nikita, should we? 
get over to some questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so one of the questions here um, is asking if you can talk a little bit about um, the investment in the infrastructure of Vivinia. Um, so how did that work and um, how did you decide to do that? Wow, great, great, great question. It's like a crane Chicago business question. I'm happy <laughs> to try to answer that one. It's excellent. Um, so I come to Ravinia. I'd worked at the Hollywood Bowl for 10 years. I was a student at Tanglewood twice and went there frequently. I knew Saratoga in upstate New York. I knew Wolf Trap really well. When I worked at the Atlanta Symphony, we had Chastain Park and Buckhead. Um, love outdoor festivals, love outdoor music, Glyndebourne, Salzburg, Edinburgh, all the great European festivals. I get to Ravinia, and I knew the quality of the classical music programming was couldn't be topped, right? Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Chicago Children's Choir, Yo-Yo Ma, Itzhak Perlman, Renee Fleming, Kiri Takanoa, on and on and on. But the facility itself, um, if one knows the term shabby chic, was leaning a little more on the shabby side than on the chic side. Um, I remember sitting my first summer with some donors in our then restaurant building. And I looked around and the lighting was not so good and there were steps into the building and some of my Ravinia audience and actually worldwide for classical music tends to skew a little more, shall we say, veteran. Um, steps are not a good thing. The food didn't look so good. The building didn't even smell that good. It just was, you know, so I sit down with the donor and I said, so how do you like the dessert you're having right now? And he said, well, this place is kind of lousy and the restaurants are terrible and their steps getting into it and the lighting is terrible and the food's not so good. And I looked at him and I said, but other than that, is everything else really good? And he laughed. And we started thinking about a restaurant building that would be the equivalent as best we could of the music making that was happening on our various stages in Bennett Gordon Hall, in the Martin Theater and on the Ravinia Pavilion. And so that's where the first big um, a project came from. What we learned by building that building, which is still there and it's beautiful, designed by Mies van der Rohe's grandson, a gorgeous sort of modernist building, but with wood and glass, and a second story. So for the very first time, the public could actually look over the beauty of the park, which is kind of staggeringly great. Um, and that started the Ravinia family thinking about what else do we need to do? And one of the first things I wanted to do was make sure that this train, where the last private train stop in Illinois, that's why we were built by a train company, you had to cross the train tracks from our main parking lot and from the train itself to get into the park. Not the safest kind of thing in the world. So we wanted to build an underpass um, that would go under that. We were having flooded parking lots. So people don't see this, but we have these huge cisterns under our parking lots that capture the water, filter it and send it into Lake Michigan. So it's all very environmentally correct. We wanted to bring video screens to our experience in the pavilion. So there are big video screens on either side of the stage, which a lot of pushback on that. That was sort of step one on Wells almost getting fired by the Ravinia Festival um, because there were those that felt I was turning it into big TV. And um, I wasn't, but I was trying to give people, especially with the Chicago Symphony, of course, for our non-classical performers as well who are used to that. But for the Chicago Symphony, um, people want to see those folks up close, the members of the orchestra. They're phenomenal musicians. If the flute is playing a solo, they want to see that person playing a solo. And then when we install the camera over the stage, looking down on the hands of a pianist, Long Long, Garrick Olson, Misha Dichter, that cemented it completely. Then everybody realized this is something that was an additive thing to the experience. And we just kept doing that. Um, the music box being the most recent addition to the park. That's excellent. Uh, this is from Lulu. What do you believe makes a performance spectacular? Boy, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. You know what it is at the end of the day? And this crosses all genres, all types of music, all artists from everywhere in the world. There has to be honesty and sincerity both in the audience toward the performer and from the performer to the audience. And I get kind of shivers thinking about that because there's so many examples of that. Let me give you a few examples of that from our non-classical side of what we do. Without question, Glenn Campbell mm. with his kids when he was suffering from Alzheimer's, that was one of the great shows of all time. And that was just flooded with emotion. Everybody in the audience knew what he was going through. He gave a great performance. It was a really hot night. 
Um, we gave uh, the light up cowboy hats from our Ravinia gift shop, another great women's board project to his daughter and son who were there because they are members of his band, but they're all, we're also there to take care of him. That was one. The late great Zhao Gilberto, one of the creators uh, with um, Gilberto Gil and, 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 and others of the Bossa Nova movement mm -hmm. on a folding chair with an espresso next to him and a guitar in the giant pavilion, absolutely telescoping everybody's focus on the simplicity, the beauty, the virtuosity, and just the, the honesty of what he was doing. Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett, absolutely astonishing. Yes, slick, great performers, but their connection was so legit. And there are a lot of situations where um, an older performer will be matched with a younger performer, and it's kind of a gimmick. That's not what this was at all. And anybody that was there uh, knows it. And you know, part of what really made that in terms of that genuine sincerity and honesty, the first of their two shows was the night the Supreme Court um, approved gay marriage. So the audience already ready to go for Gaga and Tony was particularly revved up. Then you have the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. You have Patricia Rosset singing her first Salome. Um, one of the great Strauss orchestras of the time, a great role for her, James Conlon conducting. You have Christoph Eschenbach doing Rachmaninoff opera um, and great choral works. You have um, James Levine doing Mahler II. Christoph doing Mahler VIII, which you all participated in, of course. You know what that feeling is. And when someone comes into the pavilion or they're on the lawn, you feel that electricity. And that's what makes something spectacular. Brilliant. That's incredible. Um, so another one of our singers is asking, um, you've been at Ravinia for 20 years now. Um, how do you continue to keep programming fresh? Um, and is it difficult to find something new each season? So first, I started when I was nine. So yes, it's been 20 years, but it's been a great run and I've learned a great deal. Um, <laughs> You know, for me, as a classical trained pianist, a really bad jazz pianist, and a really miserable boy soprano who did musical theater in uh, elementary school and high school, I never get tired of great performances. And so part of the answer to the question is, bringing great performers to our stages and making sure that along with the Tony Bennett's who've been performing at Ravinia for decades and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, that we're constantly flooding the place with new people. Um, whether it's Los Tigres del Norte or Wycliffe Jean or Common or Queen Latifah or Mary J. Blige or Lauren Hill, or Nora Jones, or in my time, we brought Aretha Franklin to Ravinia for the first time, and her last Chicago performances were at the park. She loved Ravinia. And part of the ease of making that happen, it may be difficult to try to get an artist who's never been to Ravinia to come for the first time, uh, a non-classical artist, because they think, well, that's where the Chicago Symphony plays in the summer. That's a classical house. Will my audience come? The hardest, um, the most difficult folks to get to, not difficult folks, the most difficult tricks to getting uh, people to Ravinia were Carlos Santana and Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks came a couple of summers ago. She did two shows, both sold out, astonishing shows. She asked to see me right before she goes on for her second show and I thought, great, she's canceling. Can I sing Rihanna and, and can I sing Landslide? No, not so much. Where's Josephine and the Children's Choir? I need help. Um, instead, she looked at me in the eyes, she shook my hand and she said, I'm incredibly angry with you. And I thought, uh-oh, she really is canceling. She was angry because I hadn't worked harder to get her to Ravinia. And the reason for that was that when an artist gets on our pavilion stage and they look into the house, because everybody sits in a flat area, right? There are no balconies. I always ask them how many seats they think it is. And they guess between 1,000 and 1,500 seats. It's a fair guess. And these are performers who've worked all over the world. It's 3,500 seats. The reason is because it's flat, you don't really have a sense of that. What that does for a Nora Jones or an Aretha Franklin or a Stevie Nicks or a Lauren Hill, especially, that was a great night, right, Josephine? Amazing. Um, is that they have an intimacy with their audience. Um, and once you get artists like that 
or Yo-Yo Ma to come back again and again and again, or Itzhak Perlman to come back again and again and again. Um, it's, it's kind of, forgive this reference, viral, um, and people talk to their friends and they say, you gotta go play that venue. And you know you can always play Northern Lee Island, you can play the Chicago Theater, you can play Tinley Park, but you should also check out Ravinia because it's a different audience, um, it's a great audience, and it's a different kind of experience for your Chicagoland experience. So it's been easier and easier as we've opened up these kind of pipelines to agents and agencies and artists, and they want their artists to play here now. When Wycliffe John's agent said he wanted to play Ravinia, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I just didn't ever think that would happen. And that happened pretty quickly in my time at Ravinia. And I knew we were on a roll um, to start making different things happen. Gaga was the same thing. Um, Lauren Hill, totally different thing. Common, completely different thing. Um, and the same with the classical artists um, and some of the more unusual projects that we've brought as well. So asking about how do you keep it fresh? One of the things I've been very proud of and very excited about was my friend Basil Twist, who is this astonishingly gifted MacArthur Genius Grant winning puppeteer. He hates that term, so Basil, I hope you're not listening to this, but that's what he is. He's a magician. And the first show we brought was a 5,000 gallon water tank in which the puppets were not actually puppets with faces or people, but color that he would swish through the, through the water to um, either Stravinsky's Firebird or Rite of Spring. I can't remember which piece of music it is. Again, Basil, I'm sorry. Um, but that was an astonishing thing for my audience to have. And when the audience starts getting excited, they wanna hear and feel different things. They want the things they expect. They want Mozart piano concertos. They want Beethoven symphonies. They want Brahms choral works. They want the great Chicago Symphony Orchestra Chorus and the Chicago Children's Choir and the CSO but they also want the new variety stuff. So it's not like it all just sort of comes to me, but in a way it kind of comes to me. So as I depart Ravinia, I'm, I'm very proud that we've opened up these pipelines because whoever takes this job is going to find themselves just a couple of steps ahead of the game. Um, and, and we'll try to get the people that I didn't get. I don't know if anybody's gonna ask the question about the ones that got away, but uh, I do have that list. So there we go. So I want to be conscious of your time. It's we're at five thirty-three. Um, let's take one more question. Yeah, Nikita, do you want to pick it? Yeah. Um, so um, one of our singers is asking, uh, "What advice would you give to us as young musicians during this challenging time?" That's a really great question. Um, a really great question. Forgive me but I'm gonna talk just a little bit about faith, but I'm gonna talk about faith, not in a generic way, but in a, as universal a way as possible. And I'm not a priest, I'm not a man of the cloth, I'm not, I am religious, but I'm not um, knowledgeable about what the great religious leaders have done. But I do know that holding to one's faith now, whatever that might be, and whatever uh, form that takes for you, and for me, it is as much going to church, it is as much going to a concert, it is as much flooding myself with music. Um, whatever shakes you down to your very core and your toes and fills you with the spirit, right? Josephine knows, and she will now, at a point when, when it's appropriate, share with uh, all of you kids, all of you young singers, who the late, great Robert Shaw was, but that's what Shaw was for me. He wasn't God. He always said that he wasn't God. People treated him like he was because he was such a brilliant man and such a great musician and such a, such a rascal <laughs> as well. But he put choral music on the map in America. There's no question about that. Um, and I think about Mr. Shaw. I think about Carla Maria Giolini. I think about Ricardo Muti. But I also think about the Chicago Children's Choir. And I think about you all having faith as we go through hand in hand, hand in hand through this difficult time. And if you need something, reach out to us big stupid adults. We will want you to ask and we will do everything we can to help you through it. I think that all sounds very kind of Hallmark card like, but I think it's important that we stay connected. I'm so glad you're doing these fireside chats. It's important to stay connected. This morning I did a Zoom meeting with my full staff, 60 of them. 
And again, I'm not very good at the techie thing. And there's the gallery thing. And I started sort of scrolling through the gallery thing and I saw all their faces and I was completely overwhelmed because I haven't seen them for so long. Um, surround yourself with the people you respect and that you love and that you can learn from and importantly, the people that you can help. And we'll get through this, we will. Thank you, Wells. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikita. Thank Great you. Great name, by the way. Great name. <laughs> did you pick that yourself or did your parents name you, Nikita? My uh, parents named me, I'm uh, Russian and Indian, and so it's uh, ah. one of the names that's common between the two cultures. Oh, is that right? I didn't know yeah. that. Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful name. Thank it's you. Great name. Um, so is Josephine a great name. <laughs> Uh, before, we, before we depart, Wells, can you just share uh, uh, briefly about the May 15th PBS broadcast? Oh, I'd be happy to. My God, we, we went through all of this and haven't talked about that. <laughs> um, and I think somebody asked, you know, what is a spectacular performance? How do you keep it fresh? Part of keeping it fresh was bringing my dear friend, who I've known for over 30 years, Marin Alsop, to come to Ravinia Festival and curate our celebration of the late, great Leonard Bernstein. She was his last student. She was his protege. She was his only female student. And when she and I started talking about what form that might take um, at Ravinia, we were having dinner in Denver, Colorado. I'll never forget it. And I sort of sheepishly looked up at her from my steak or Brussels sprouts or whatever it was. And I said, very gingerly and very kind of timidly, would you be interested in doing Lenny's mass? And almost simultaneously, she was going to ask me the same question. And then we developed a team of people, she and I, including the children's choir and Josephine and children's choir grown up vocality and these amazing, um, street singers, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and the Highland Park High School Marching Band, amazing. Woo. And put these folks together for an evening in 2018 that I'll never forget. 95 to 100 minutes of straight through music with no opportunity for an audience to release, right? There aren't places where people clap. It's straight through. I didn't know what people would think of it. I knew the piece pretty well. Josephine, you knew the piece pretty well. Marin had done the piece all over the world. The Bernstein, Jamie Bernstein was there. Paolo Jot, our celebrant, good Lord, our amazing celebrant, um, had never done the piece before. Great actor, great singer, great emotional man. I know all of you kids that participated in that, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that happened and the audience erupted, erupted. And for the next week to two weeks, my email was flooded with people saying it was the most extraordinary experience they'd ever had at Ravinia or any other concert hall in their lives. And thank God the Ravinia family very generously said, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back and film it for television. So on May 15th, on PBS nationally, um, people will get a chance who didn't get to see it and those who did get to see it, who I think will want to see it again, because the director is the best classical music director in the world. Um, great guy, right? Just yes. a total pro. Paolo, the children's choir, vocality, the marching band, the CSO, Marin, and the street chorus, these street singers, you've just got to see it. And if there was ever a piece built for this time we're living through, yes, Mrs. Solemnis, yes, Beethoven 9, yes, all the Requiems, Verdi, Brahms, you name it. But Bernstein's Mass is the right piece because it is of our time. And, and who knows what he would have been doing with this virus. I know it would have been something extraordinary because he never didn't do something extraordinary. Um, we miss him terribly. So let's celebrate with this amazing piece that he wrote in the early 70s in a very politically fraught time, not a virus time, but a politically fraught time in a country divided into partisan camps. How does that feel but familiar? Um, it's, it's a great, great thing to be watching and we're all looking forward to it. I think Marin did one of these chats, right? He did. And I think you and I are gonna do one before the performance online um, with some of our colleagues. Yes. Um, so that'll be fun to do, just to be together even in a virtual way, right? Um, it'll be really fun. I think Josh from the, uh, the marching band's gonna join. Nice. Um, and George Preston from WFMT. Yeah, it's gonna be a wonderful thing. So forgive the shameless plug, but you brought it up. So I thank you for doing that. May 15th, PBS, eight o'clock, WTTW. Thank you, Wells. Pleasure, thank you all Love so much. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.